And today I have with me Dave Howard and his new book is Chasing Phil. And we are doing this in person at a bookstore in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. And I'm so excited. This is the first time I've done this. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle, for having me. <laughs> Fun to be and here. Chasing, this is the new hardback. I had the paper. I had one of the, where did it go? The paperback. Oh, it's under here. Oh, did I put it under there? Okay. Yeah. But this is the hardcover. And oh my goodness, this book. It was crazy. I made so many notes, David. But first <laughs> of all, like, I love, the, I love the title. And I love it more now after finishing the book. Oh, good. Because he That's was great. like, what does that mean? And then you're done. You're like, oh, because I feel like I was chasing Phil. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Phil is quite a, a worthy adversary for a change. <laughs> so the book is about, and I'm going to get his last name right, Phil Kitzer. Yes. Okay, and he is a big time con man. This is a true story. Mm -hmm. And um, so these two guys go undercover from the FBI. It's their first time going undercover. And they start chasing him and trying to, you know, go figure out what he's doing and how they can get him, basically. Right. Right. Right, and um, what makes part of what makes the story fun is the two guys, these two uh, FBI agents, were uh, at the time very young agents. Um, they came into this case having no undercover experience whatsoever, and not only did they have no experience, but they had no training of any kind, um, and they were using their real names. Um, that part I found crazy. Yeah. So if you go through, uh, the FBI had um, just started its uh, undercover program. Um, it was something that they hadn't done for about 50 years um, during uh, J. Edgar Hoover's entire reign. He did not believe in doing undercover work. He thought the agents would be corrupted um, by spending too much time with people like Phil Kitzer. <laughs> and, and so he died in 1972. Uh, this book takes place in 1977, and in th that time, the FBI had sort of slowly started building this undercover program, but very few agents had received any training uh, in it or received, you know, alternate identities um, and the things that we consider sort of normal for undercover uh, operatives now. Um, and so these guys hadn't had a chance to, to do this training yet. And so they hadn't received any kind of, um, you know, false identities. And so they go in, they're using their real names. They're using their personal credit cards. One of them, uh, JJ, the main uh, FBI agent, is, right. um, you know, operating this whole thing out of his apartment um, in Indiana. And so, you know, all these con men, everything, have his personal phone number, his home phone number. His, uh, his roommates answering the phone and taking calls. From us. <laughs> and so the whole thing just really speaks to, to how unprepared everybody was for um, this whole operation. And that includes uh, the two agents, the Bureau themselves, and, and Phil, the target of the investigation. One of the reasons that it um, turns out to be successful is because um, Phil, it never occurs to him that... Um, the FBI might actually attempt to do this kind of thing. And so um, the moment you're talking about uh, at the beginning of the book, they first meet Phil, and the idea is that they're just going to have one meeting. Right. So that's why everybody thought, like, all right, these guys are totally unprepared, but it's just one meeting. What, what could what, happen? What could possibly happen? <laughs> right. And so um, the meeting goes well. And they want to buy a, uh, a stolen bond from him. They are looking for something to pin on Phil. Right. To actually be able to prosecute him because no one had been able to. And Phil says, I can't do that for you. But, you know, I know somebody who might have that kind of thing. Why don't you come with me to Cleveland tomorrow? And so they're like, ah, we're, <laughs> we're going to go to Cleveland now. Uh, and the FBI, is, their bosses are just like, do not go to Cleveland. You know, uh, it's not a good idea. You're not prepared for this. They go to Cleveland, uh, and from there, uh, Phil latches on to them and starts to think of them as his sort of young con men in training, and they um, they end up spending the next eight months with him. 
it's totally a crazy story. And I had just read, it's funny coming off of Stephen Bentley's book, Undercover. Mm -hmm. And he was, it was in England though. Right. And he went undercover as drug, you know, this is not drug related, but it was so cool reading this book after reading his book, because I'm really understanding the undercover part aspect. Yeah. And, um, and when the FBI was like worried about them going undercover and what would happen, but it kind of did, even though it was a shorter amount of time, they got really comfortable. They did. You uh, know, that's what I got from it is that they got started to get really comfortable with this guy. And they had yeah. a couple of close, they got so comfortable that it's a good thing it was 1977. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> This uh, operation would not have worked today. Um, Absolutely not. Starting on with, both ends, right? On both on ends. Both ends. Starting with the problem of Google. To be right. Honest. Right. Like, with who Google. Are these guys? Let me type. You know. <laughs> um, but yeah, they became. Uh, they were sort of like really smart guys who um, quickly figured out how to how to get away with uh, playing fictional versions of themselves, basically. And uh, they learned on the fly. They um, they just puzzled through it, and um, you know made some mistakes along the way that nearly cost them the the whole thing. It could have blown up. Um, it nearly blows up at multiple points. I love I love the um, the car. The Thunderbird car, yeah. The car when you know, yeah. like he just takes off, so yeah. he can't yeah. see. So they're afraid that Phil's going to see the car and yeah. know. And and it was close, right? Yeah, it was a close exactly. call, and and yeah. and you know, it's funny because these guys like Jack is having children, yeah. so he's constantly going back and and like you said today, you couldn't do that. You got location services. You got like he yeah. would just be missing yeah. and come back, yeah. and you know, he'd be like, "Hey, where were you?" Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're exactly. a hard guy to find, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're. You know, where did you go? And um, and those things you could just disappear. Right. And that's what they did uh, at different points over the course of this eight months. They um, would go back to do their paperwork to, right. to uh, you know, uh, update their bosses on what they were finding and learning. Um, it, it grew to be an extraordinarily complicated case involving um dozens of people around around the globe um and so they were opening cases by the dozens right um uh involving ripoffs of people ranging from elvis presley um to uh foreign yeah, governments great story to, great yeah, yeah that was another you know and of course when you look it up on um wiki you get that one the elvis presley story yeah comes up very quickly yeah. you yes. know it's a favorite story among Elvis fans and uh, conspiracy theorists. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have a technical question. Like, so I'm, you know, this is way above my pay grade in yeah. con men. <laughs> so, so I'm like really trying to understand how they got, how did Phil get away? Like, first of all, he couldn't get away with what he got away with then. Now, right? right. There's would, no way. Right, he would come up with a different variation of it that... Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are things out there now that, you know, they get they get smarter as technology gets smarter. Yeah. But back then, what, you know, in, in layman's terms, like, what did he do? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. It is, he was a sort of, he was an ingenious guy um, who, who essentially came up with a scheme that was almost foolproof, except for this was the only thing that would have, uh, that um, would have succeeded in taking him down. But basically, he traveled around the world creating what he called briefcase banks. And he would go to a place like St. Vincent in the Caribbean, Mm -hmm. which had very few uh, rules regarding banks. Right. And he would open, he would do the paperwork, and he would open a legitimate bank, but then he would put no money in it. It would be insolvent. It would be basically worthless. Um, And then he would print up a bunch of documents from his bank. Uh, certificates of deposit, letters of credit, and so on. And he would take them out into the world and convince people that they had real value and that uh, they were worthwhile to people, that people should pay money for them. Uh, He made millions of dollars doing this. And what was ingenious about it was these, he would tell the people who got them, you can't cash this, you can't take this to a bank and cash it. 
But you can, if you are a businessman who's building a tower and need, you're trying to get a loan for construction, here's a, a you know, half million dollar letter of credit. You can put that into your books and suddenly you're worth more money. You're worth far more than you seem to be. And now banks will uh, give right. you a loan. And so they, he created these documents that would kind of disappear into the, the banking network. And... Um, it really sealed him off from, from prosecution. And if anyone called him on it, he would say, oh, this was just a bad business deal. It was high finance. I got mixed up. He, had, uh, he would create fake correspondence uh, that uh, you know, sort of falsified the, the terms of the deal. He would do a lot of things that swept his tracks away. Um, and in the end, the big problem when they tried to catch him before the events of Chasing Phil, uh, they would just say, well, you can't prove I was trying to defraud anybody. You know? Right. Because the wording in his documents was such that people weren't paying attention. Exactly. And That's, he didn't do what he did. He did everything that the paperwork said right. correctly. So that was another big part of it is he, you know, uh, people, if anyone who's taken a mortgage out, you know, you, you get a stack <laughs> yeah, of documents yeah. that thing, and nobody reads all that Right. Stuff. Nobody reads the fine print. You can't. Right. Um, and so he would bury something, you know, on the 46th page of a 55-page document that would have the precise wording that would enable him to, to wiggle out of the right of the jam if, if, it, uh, if it blew up on him. Um, and so he was an extremely uh, fiercely intelligent guy who, who knew the insurance and banking industry inside and out, and, and he could basically anticipate every trap in front of him and, and step around it, find a way he, around it. I, I think that he was such, I don't, I don't know if he was a narcissist as much as like just thinking he wasn't that interesting because every time the FBI came up in conversation, he was just kind of like, nah, I'm, they're not looking for people like me. Right. You know, so it's almost like, I don't know if that was narcissistic or just that naive that he thought that he just wasn't that important, you know? Well, he was partly right that, um, uh, again, during Hoover, the FBI um, right. did not... Hoover thought of white-collar crime as that's somebody else's problem. Right. Um, we chase bank robbers. We chase kidnappers. We chase, uh, you know, murderers. And so in that sense, he was he was right that um, they're not going to bother with, you know, people like me because they'll just ask the SEC to get involved or, right. you know. Um, and I think the other aspect of him... Again, he, he spent so much time thinking through his schemes and building defenses into them that he literally felt that he was uncatchable. Right. He, he believed that he had found, basically pulled off a perfect crime. Yeah. And he almost did. He almost did. He did for a decade of uh, traveling around the world, making millions of dollars untouched. Right. So, yeah, and I, you know, I don't want to give everything away, even though we know how it ends up. It's yeah. like, I want everybody to read it because the story of what happens is the book. Because when you're writing a true story, you know, the beginning, you know, the end. So yeah. what is the, and that your writing was amazing. Oh, thank like you. it kept me page, you know, thank turning. You. They, and I love the characters and they were great guys, yeah. you know, so it was really yeah. fun. And the characters were really fun. They really so were. And uh, when I went to look this up, is it true that this has been bought for a movie? Yes. So wait, I, and Robert Downey Jr. is playing right. Phil. Same thing, Phil. Okay, how like aren't you blown away by that? Yeah, because uh, it's uh, rarely have I come across such a perfect matching. I, that's what match. I was thinking. I was like, I can't even picture anybody else playing Phil. Uh, it's uh, it's he's gonna play. He's gonna be you know body type wise and yeah. just personality wise. Yeah. I, I can't believe it. I yeah. mean, you must be just. Are, are you a part of it? Well, uh, it's my book. Right, so, so you so get that. to be... But sometimes authors are like, you know what, that's another... You know, like after you sign it off, they're not really a big part, but are yeah. you? Yeah, well... Um, okay, will you get to meet Robert Downey Jr.? I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yet. I mean, I hope so. It would be fun. Um, I definitely I'm, think you will. Yeah. I, they're going to invite I, you to set. I hope that happens, you know. Um, I'm... If this movie, uh, I'm, I'm happy just to be connected to it through the book, and um, I'm, I am 
really eager to see how it all unfolds on um, the idea of, of seeing uh, uh, Downey playing Phil. But the second I heard it, I just immediately felt like there could not be a more perfect well, pairing. Um, I just so. think it's so exciting. How many authors like want to get their book made into a movie? Like I, When I saw that, I was thinking, well, is that true? I mean, is it really true? Like yeah. this, this is your second book. I mean, as an author, that's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. You know? Uh, and uh, when you were writing it, did you really think that it was possible, that it was going to become a movie? Well, the odd part of this, uh, and the truly surprising part, was that um, the book was still in the proposal stage when uh, it was optioned by the Downey team, by Team Downey. Uh, team and Downey. I love that. Team Downey. And uh, so I hadn't even, I didn't even have a book contract yet. Um, and I had this. All you had was the the option. And was, and just so everybody knows, this book doesn't come out until October tenth. Right. So if you try to go on Amazon, even I tried to get the audio book because I wanted to listen to, uh, and you can't even get the audio book till October tenth. Right. Although you can so, pre-order now, just so everybody. Knows. Yes, you can pre-order you can order it, it, but you can't. Like I wanted to download it last because I like to listen to the narrators. Yeah. You know, so I was like, I want to hear it, and you know, but you can't. You can't until October tenth. So. Yeah. But it was, it was, how much fun was it to do this? I know it took you a while and I knew you had to interview them because they are, they are still online. The guys are Jim Wittick. And, W-E-D-I-C-K. Yes. And is that how, did I say it right? Yes. Okay. And Jack Brennan. And Jack Brennan. And they are still both like, you know, alive and, and working and, you know. Uh, alive and well. Um, they participated, uh, allowed me to interview them for a couple of years uh, straight. We worked. I, I, we burned up the phone lines. We met in person a number of times. Um, we're sort of spread across the country, so right. there were some logistical issues, but we spent a lot of time talking. Um, we should probably point out that Phil Kitzer himself uh, is no longer alive. He, oh, he died in 2001. Just, that's right. I did read um, that, yes. He was older. At the time this book takes place in 1977, the agents were young. They were right. 27 they were in their 20s. and 31. Oh, and 31. Okay. And Phil and then, was 40, 44, 45. Right. So he was almost a generation older um, and, you know, he lived a hard life. But, yes. Uh, he, uh, he lived to be into his late 60s, I believe. Um, yeah, and I'd like to talk more about that, but I don't want to talk about the end. <laughs> I really appreciate that. I'm I really was, trying to not, I yeah. mean, like I said, we know how it ends, but really I loved your ending so much and Thank the you. way you wrapped yeah. it all up that I yeah. just don't want to go there. Thank you. So uh, <laughs> I, I was going to, I was going to throw in spoiler alert. You know, no, 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 no spoilers. We don't do but spoilers. But I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. Thank because you. I really want everybody to go out and get it. So here. The ending is fun. The ending is a lot of fun. Yeah. The ending is, the last quarter of the book was a lot of fun. Oh, good. Even though That's I enjoyed great. the whole book, That's I was great. really enjoying the ending part of it. So, yeah, so it's, it's a little surprising. A and I don't people, know that yeah, people will know. I think it's going to be surprising for people. You know, even my editor was surprised um, that, you know, a lot of these books, once the arrest happens, you kind of feel like, all right, the story it's is over. Is, but it's over not. And down. But yeah, there's a lot of things that happen, a lot of twists and turns that take place even after the arrest. So I, I feel enormously um, lucky, you know, that, right. that um, the story had this incredible kind of narrative arc to it that um, it was so much fun to work on. Just yes. and to answer your question, it was. Uh, I, I've never enjoyed working on oh, some something so much. Oh, how that's... much fun. I mean, it's just so much fun. Oh, it was, was, you know, because as I'm reading, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing how you wrote it and everything, I'm like, this must have been a blast. I mean, you yeah. made it so much fun to read, so I can only imagine how much fun it was, like, to actually write it yeah. and, you know, and work on it and, and meet these guys and, and now get it made into a movie. Like, that is just crazy. Yeah. I can't wait. Do we know when? Um, I, well, I know that, um, they're right now revising a script that's been written. So, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to kind of anticipate the timeline of these things. Right. So I am just kind of waiting for an update, but it seems like, um, the wheels are turning. All right. Well, will you give us an update? Absolutely. Right, yeah. So I want to know and I'll post it around and, you know, get as yeah. much hype for this, but everybody, October 10th. This comes out chasing Phil, and I will put all your links so people can find you. And you're around. You're doing. Are you doing book tour, book signing? Yes, yes. I'll be in. Uh, I want my book signed. I'll be in Philadelphia at the end of October. 
I'll be in uh, Providence um, uh, mid-October and in uh, Middletown, Connecticut. Um, I'm probably doing something else here in um, the Lehigh Valley uh, this fall. And uh, all that stuff is on my website. And I will be posting his website, so I'm sure so. you can go. And I'm going to get my book signed. Yes. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> and thank you so much for meeting with me. This is thank so much fun. Much. My first one oh, in person. Great. Yeah, this was really fun. Thanks you get for to having be, me You here. get to be the first person. So. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so everybody, Chasing Phil, go get the book. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.